O my Lord, make me brave, brave, and make my past easy for me, easy for me. A faith step onto the cloud of Islam, and you will discover the light of Iman. Proclaim this message entrusted to you, and the cloud of Islam will carry you. We say Allah Akbar, meaning Allah is the great. We read chapters and verses from the Holy Quran, celebrating the praises of God. And we go into different postures. And in every posture, we celebrate, we praise. We go into prostration, into sujood, and in that position we say, Subhana Rabbi A'la, which means glory to God in the highest, the highest part of man, goes down to the lowest before his maker, and we praise him to the highest, the highest. This is the form of our prayer. This is also according to your Bible. Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. Means he made the sujood. And Moses and Aaron made the sujood. And Joshua made the sujood. And Hazrat Isa alayhi salam made the sujood. How does a man fall on his face and pray? Except the way the Muslim does. Muslim does. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I bring to you peace and salutations from the deepest south of Africa. If you look at the map of the continent of Africa, right down at the bottom end is a country called the Republic of South Africa, where some 400,000 Muslims live. Now, in that country, we Muslims number less than 2%. We Muslims happen to be a minority of a minority in two different groups. A minority of a minority. We are in an ocean of Christianity. If the Libyans boast that their country has the highest percentage of Muslims on the continent of Africa, then South Africa boasts the biggest percentage of Christians on the continent of Africa. Now, in that country, we have evolved certain systems and methods of delivering the message of Islam by means of lectures and by literature. And some of the simplest method we have found in lecture form is to invite the non-Muslim, to attract the non-Muslim, to our masjids. We have opened our masjids for visitors or tours. Now, the Durban Corporation of our municipality has put the masjid on its tours, visitors. And they have certain tours, and among them, one is called the Oriental Tour. And in this Oriental Tour, the first port of call is the mosque. From there, they go to the Indian market and they buy some curios and spices and they take them to a hotel some five miles out of town and give them teas and refreshments and they show them the Indian University. But of course, in South Africa, Indian University means the Indian Muslim, the Indian Christian, the Indian Hindu, they all congregate in the same university, the Indian University. And they show them the elite Indian homes. And eventually, they round off the tour by visiting the largest temple, the Hindu temple in South Africa which is in Durban. The city where I come from has the largest mosque, masjid south of the equator, and it also has the largest temple in South Africa. Now, before they leave for the mosque, they give us a ring, telephone call. They say, look, there are 50 people on the bus. So we go and welcome them. Ahlan wa sahlan. We say, please take off your shoes. And while they're taking off the shoes, we start a conversation. Say, do you know why you're taking off your shoes? The answer is always no. Would you like to know? Nobody ever says he doesn't want to know. You see, it's the nature of man, he wants to know why. So he says, you remember, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, God spoke to him, and he said, so saying we quote from the Bible, which is common to both the Jews and the Christians, because most of these visitors are Jews and Christians. 
So we quote them from their own holy scripture, their own holy book, saying that God Almighty, he told to Moses, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. We say, in respect that of that commandment, we Muslims, we take off our shoes. Because to us, Moses, Hazrat Musa is as much our prophet as Jesus and Muhammad are. We respect them all. We revere them all. So we are fulfilling a commandment as given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. Secondly, before we go in for Salat, we have an arrangement in the Masjid. Our arrangement is quite different from what is in most modern day mosques. We have a pool, a pool of water. And this pool has seats with taps around it. And we explain about wudu, that before we go into prayer, we make ablution. All the exposed parts of the body are being washed, the hands, the feet, the nostrils, gargling the mouth, brushing the teeth. This the Muslim does five times a day, every day of the year, the one who's particular with his prayers. And purely from the hygienic point of view, no one is going to find fault with the person who washes himself five times a day. It's a good hygienic practice. And everyone who nods his head, it is a good hygienic practice. Secondly, it also serves certain psychological purposes, meaning mentally is preparing the person for prayer. And thirdly, this is also another commandment given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. In the book of Exodus, that is the second book of the Bible, the Christian Bible, the Old and the New Testament put together, the Christian Bible, in the second book, called the book of Exodus, it is written. And Moses and Aaron and the sons, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, Hazrat Harun alayhi salam, and their sons, washed their hands and the feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. So we Muslims are still fulfilling another biblical commandment. Though we haven't got the label of a Jew, nor yet that of a Christian. Yet in all humility we claim that we are more Jewish than the Jews and more Christians than the Christians. In this, that we are trying to follow in the footsteps of the prophets. We are not claiming to be an immaculate people, a nation of angels, that we have no black sheep in our midst. We also have our fair share of all the good and the bad to be found in every other religious group. But we say that you will find that the Muslim is more particular in the fulfillment of his religious obligations than any other religious group. And in this regard, we tell our audience, our visitors, that I might as well quote you an American, Bodley by name. He has written a book on the life of Muhammad وسلم, called The Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. And in that book he says, that there are more professing Christians in the world than professing Muslims. I mean, people who say that they are Christians, there are more who fill the census form in the world saying that there are Christians than those that say that there are Muslims. That there are more professing Christians in the world than professing Muslims. But, he says, but there are more practicing Muslims in the world than practicing Christians. I say to the visitors, I say, that if I said this on my own account, blowing my own trumpet wouldn't have carried much, much weight. It makes me happy to quote an outsider, one of your own men. And with this introduction, we say now we will go into the main house of prayer and I will demonstrate to you all how we Muslims pray. And they come into the main mosque proper and we have them seated against the wall for comfort, sitting down on the carpet, on the ground, which is really an experience of a lifetime for the Westerner on the carpet, on the ground. While seated against the wall, they would be facing the Kaaba, Mecca. And all the masjids in South Africa, they're all facing north. So we point out there that every mosque in South Africa, they face north because Mecca is to the north of South Africa. But if you go to the east, wherever Muslims live, you'll find that all the masjids, the mosques are facing west. And from the western countries, they're facing east. And from the northern hemisphere, they're facing south. The attention of the Muslim world converges onto one spot, Mecca, to symbolize the unity of the Muslim people, that they have a common direction of prayer, not that God is there. 
because the Holy Quran tells us, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِكُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ To Allah belongs the East and the West. فَأَيْنَ مَا تُوَلُّوا فَسَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ And whichsoever way ye turn is the presence of Allah. This only symbolizes our unity. Facing in that direction, we say, Allahu Akbar, meaning Allah is the greatest. With folded arms, we read chapters and verses from the Holy Quran, celebrating the praises of God. And we go into different postures. And in every posture, we celebrate His praises. In the Ruku, which we demonstrate, we say, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, which means glory to God the Great, glory to God the Great, glory to God the Great. From there, from the Ruku, the semi-bent position, we arise, saying, Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, which means Allah listens to the one that praises Him. We have the assurance that our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, who is closer to us than our jugular veins, as the Holy Quran testifies, it says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُوا إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ That we are indeed closer to you than your very life vein, the very essence of your being. If our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, if He is that close to us, then we do not have to shout on the top of our voices, wanting a deaf God to hear, because He listens to our secret thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, and with that assurance we arise. Sami Allahu liman hamida. And from that position, we say, Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. We go into prostration, into sujood, and in that position we say, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Which means glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest. The highest part of man goes down to the lowest before his maker and we praise him to the highest. This is the form of our prayer. And this is also biblical. Means this is also according to your Bible. This is also biblical. Because this is how all the prophets prayed. Now when we say all the prophets prayed, to the Westerner it sounds like a sweeping generalization. But it is not so, I tell them, I remind them, that it is not so. If you have been reading your own holy scriptures, the Bible, you will be able to confirm what I'm going to quote you now. And I quote from the Old Testament. This is actually the Bible of the Jews, which the Christians have inherited. The Old Testament is the Bible of the Jews. I said, I quote from the Old Testament. Reading, and Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And we read again, and Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And again, and Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. When we come to the New Testament, we learn that towards his last days on earth, Jesus Christ, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. And he told them, wait and watch, meaning keep guard. Wait and watch. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God and fell on his face and prayed to God. Say, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, meaning remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. In the end, I leave it to you, O oh Lord. But I want you to save me. Ya Bari Tala, save me. But as a good Muslim, he submitted his will to the will of God. Muslim. He said, I submit. Whatever you want to do, I'm prepared to go through with it, but I would like you to save me. What did he do? What did he do? He said, wait and watch. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. So we ask our audience, how does a man fall on his face and pray? Except the way the Muslim does. Can a circus acrobat do anything better than that? And the mind searches and there is no answer except this. The only way Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God means he made the sujood. And Moses and Aaron made the sujood. And Joshua made the sujood. And Hazrat Isa alayhi salam made the sujood. So we Muslims, we are not ashamed to humble ourselves the manner in which the spiritual physicians of mankind, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Jesus, Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of God be upon all his messengers. As they did it, we are not ashamed to do likewise. And as such, we are able to use the masjid and we end off by giving these people free literature.
واخر الدعوان ان الحمد لله رب العالمين اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي اسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام الى المسجد الاقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من اياتنا انه هو السميع البصير صدق الله صدق الله المولانا العظيم ماي ديير برادرن اي هاف ريد تو يو ذا فيرست فيرس اوف سوره بني اسرائيل ويتش از ذا 17th chapter of the holy quran now in this verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this event which took place in the life of the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam mi'raj meaning the ascension in which the holy prophet muhammad was taken according to the majority of the commentators with whom i agree that physically he was transported from the masjid al haram that is the masjid at makkah the holy mosque the sacred mosque in makkah from there he was transported to the farthest mosque which was in baitul muqaddis that is jerusalem and from there he was transported into the spiritual realms physically now the difficulty with uh, many muslims about miraj is whether it was spiritual or whether it was physical no doubt in islamic tradition uh, we read of a number of experiences that our holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had in what is called asra or being taken up isra miraj but this one in particular the commentators say that it was physical now what is the difficulty the difficulty is for modern man he says now how can anybody be taken out into outer space and into the great beyond because we know that as we go higher and higher there is lack of oxygen and uh, freezing one would freeze to death if we go to a place like let's say the moon they say on the sunny side of the moon where we see the bright brightness where the sun is shining it is so hot that the human kind his blood will boil in 2 minutes on the shaded side he will freeze in the same amount of time so how can anybody be taken out of this environment into another environment and be brought back safe and sound well giving some little thought to this i find that there are so many things which to the layman is impossible to comprehend for example our own movement on earth we are told by learned men science men of science geographers astronomers that we are at the present moment i myself included while seated here so comfortably am being rotated that this earth is rotating and we all of us on it are rotating at a speed of 1000 miles an hour the circumference of the earth being 24000 and once in 24 hours we make one complete revolution so we are traveling while seated comfortably at 1000 miles an hour in one direction rotation 1000 miles an hour everything is being taken for a ride 1000 miles an hour but this is one movement there is another secondary movement that while the earth is rotating the earth is going around the sun and we are told that the speed at which it is moving around the sun in an elliptical orbit is 66000 miles an hour which goes round and round while rotating going round and round the sun in 365 and a quarter day 365 and a quarter 66000 miles an hour in a forward direction and 1000 miles an hour in a rotary motion now if we tell this to the layman that he is making two movements one of 1000 miles an hour and another at 66000 miles an hour he will laugh at you he will laugh at us he says look man what are you talking about i can see i am on terra firma solid earth how come that you are telling me that we are moving and at such a, a stupendous speed at 60 miles an hour in a motor car at 100 miles an hour in a motor car we know how uncomfortable we feel 
And how is it that at that stupendous speed, no movement is perceptible even? So the answer is in this, that for God Almighty, He has protected us through this atmosphere, forces of gravity, and we are being taken around in comfort and in ease without even perceiving any movement. Leave out 1,000 miles or 66,000 miles, no movement at all. We feel as if we are remaining fixed in space somewhere. And it is the sun that is going round and round and round, whereas in actual fact it is we who are going round and round and round. So if God Almighty can protect us in so easily, so comfortably, if he wants to transport his servant from place to place in a capsule of his making, what is impossible for him? He has the power to do what he wills. And today, we are having science fiction. And in science fiction, they are showing us, in my own country, there is a series of programs, they call them Star Trek, invent as they programmed in America, Star Trek, in which they show us that how spaceships are going around in the universe and that man is being transported, he is being changed from one form into another, from one, one uh, from the spaceship onto some planet and from the planet back to uh, the spaceship and uh, as if he is being disintegrated in front of your eyes and taken from place to place. Now, this idea that man can be transported, it is possible maybe in a hundred years time, in a thousand years time, whatever the mind of man he has been able to conceive and perceive so far, he has been able to do. Ten years before the first man landed on the moon, Kennedy, he proclaimed to the American public that within the next ten years we will land on the moon. And he did it. Then we have been talking about Mars and Jupiter probes and they are making probes. They are going, they are sending the spaceships, they are sending the satellites and they are coming back with information. So, if man can do that today by knowing about what is in the heavens, if it is easy for him, we say, the Muslim, the man of faith, he says, if my Lord says that he can do something for his prophet, his chosen messenger, it is nothing difficult for him. So we believe, the Muslims as a whole, we believe in the ascensions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam, that Allah bari ta'ala took him up and the experience which he had. He gave us those experiences, he narrated them to us, and in this experience, one of the greatest gifts he brought for the Muslim was Salat. Salat became fard upon the Muslim. And we hear in Islamic tradition that from 50 times a day, gradually it was reduced to five times a day. So here is a blessing for us in this event, which we can remind ourselves. And five times a day, every day of the year, we can communicate with the Lord and create that nearness, that awareness. That when we stand in his presence, we can stand, as the prophet said, Ka'annakataraho, as if thou seest him, that though you see him not, he sees you, and this is the miraj of the Muslim. May Allah bari ta'ala make you and all, all of us, you know, benefit from this spiritual experience of the Prophet. Wa akhirud dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. <laughs>